All right, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I'm having a bit of trouble with my voice this morning, so this, uh, my delivery might be a bit more sultry than is strictly speaking appropriate for fossil fish, uh, but please bear with. Um, so this is a talk about, um, about this animal called Diplocanthus crassissimus, which is an acanthodium um, from Scotland, but I kind of made it slightly more general than the abstract, so it now has bonus added endoskeleton for you to look forward to, all you acanthodium aficionados. Uh, before I start, thanks to these various people who've helped me in lots of different ways, from scanning to museum collections. Um, so really this is a talk about jawed vertebrates, or nathostomes. Um, and jawed vertebrates are divided into two groups, the osteichthyans, or bony fishes, uh, and the chondrichthyans, or cartilaginous fishes. Um, and these two groups are divided, well, kind of divided by these fundamental differences in characters. So as their name uh, suggests, uh, osteichthyans tend to have more bone, chondrichthyans tend to have more cartilage. Osteichthyans have a skeleton of big head plates and um, big scales, at least primitively. Uh, sharks have scales of like tiny little scales. And there's also endocranial differences. So um, chondrichthyans tend to have this sort of broad, this is like the base of the, the, the neurocranium. In uh, osteichthyans, it tends to be narrow. And in osteichthyans, the gill skeleton is all situated underneath the head. Uh, so you can see in this cod, you can't really see the gill skeleton because it's obscured by those plates. But that illustrates quite well that it's all underneath the head. Whereas in that shark, it's all behind the head, so it's been kind of shunted back and extends cordially. And trying to work out what's what with all of these kind of endocranial differences is, is important because of the fundamental part it plays in kind of scenario building about how uh, things evolved in the very early parts of jawed vertebrate evolution. Things like uh, the pectoral girdle and jaws all tie into things like pharyngeal evolution. Um, and in the past, when scenario building about this kind of thing, the chondrichthians have had a bit of a bad rap as a sort of primitive set of antediluvian archetypes um, that sort of terrorized the seas and which are very ancient. I did some research into this earlier this year. Um, and but it, that's not really fair. And really to find the answer to things like uh, how things like jaws and gills evolved, we have to look at the fossils from the Paleozoic uh, when these two groups diverged. Um, so this is the scheme of relationships, and I'm going to be tackling this today by talking about the, this group, well, not a group, this collection of fish called the Acanthodians, which were swimming around in the seas of the Paleozoic, um, and how they can help us kind of reconstruct uh, chondrichthyan evolution. Uh, so these are, this is some pictures of some nice Acanthodians. Uh, these, they're all sort of convincingly fish-shaped, but the problem with them is that they very, very rarely uh, preserve any endoskeleton, any kind of internal structures of the pharynx and head, uh, which makes piecing together things like how gills evolved quite difficult. Um, and we do know some stuff about acanthodian endoskeletons. So this is acanthodes, uh, which is where we get almost all our information. And it's got um, this sort of narrow basiosiput, which if you remember is kind of like what we see in uh, osteichthyans. It's got um, known from moulds, which are quite difficult to interpret. And so there's been lots of arguments about the exact interpretation of it. So it's not an ideal thing. It's also very late occurring. It's from the Permian. So we don't really know how uh, good a model it is for what acanthodians look like in the Devonian. The other thing we have is Tomacanthus. Now, this is an early Devonian acanthodian that I'm going to talk about later. And for this, we've got kind of a grotty imprint of a brain case um, on this, uh, this rock. So, and it looks very different to acanthodes. It's got this kind of broad basocranium like chondrichthyans. Um, and we know a bit about how things are related as well. Acanthodians are fairly safely all stem group chondrichthians now. Um, and this is some trees I ran from the data set of uh, Coates et al, uh, who recently did a paper on an animal called Gladbacchus, which is a stem chondrichthian, which you should remember the name of. Um, and he argued that you tend to, or observe, that you tend to get this, this, gr this kind of rump grade at the bottom of the chondrichthian stem, which has some acanthodians in. And then on the other side, you have other acanthodians kind of more crownwards at the stem group. Um, and he found Gladbacchus, which is that animal with the gill skeleton laid out up at the top. Uh, he found that that's kind of interspersed with these things that look more acanthogeny, things that have lots of fin spines are interspersed with Gladbacchus, which has a long extended elasmobranch-like pharynx and no fin spines. Um, so this is kind of a hop through some stuff I did in my PhD using synchrotron tomography to, and uh, computer tomography to try and work out what's going on with other acanthodian endoskeletons. What do they look like? Do they look like acanthodes or tomacanthus or neither? Can we use that to thrash out an idea of uh, when anatomical uh, kind of changes happened in the chondrichthyan stem group? And does the, the hypothesis of relationships that Coates talked about withstand scrutiny when you add additional endoskeletal information? So the first one I'm going to talk about, we're going to talk about two taxa. The first is diplocanthus. Um, and this is from this rump clade, this acanthodii. 
So it's Middle Devonian, it's Scottish. Uh, this is a specimen we scanned. It has, uh, almost uniquely, it has all these cartilages preserved, but they're very difficult to interpret from the surface of the specimen. So it's been known about for a long time, but people have struggled. So we synchrotron scanned it. Uh, there's supposed to be a video that didn't work, but what you can see is that uh, the kind of teal bit is the jaws. They're kind of open, uh, lower jaw, upper jaw, bits of the brain case up here, and then we've got gill arches in the back. So we've got sort of approximately 50% of this animal's head. Um, and what this tells us is that it looks a lot like Acanthodes. The gill arches sort of look like Acanthodes, uh, but the gill arches also seem to all be sat underneath the neurocranium, like in osteichthyms, although it's a bit of a splatted animal, so that's not that safe. Uh, the mandibular arch looks like Acanthodes, and the basi occiput, which if you remember is that bit at the back of the bottom of the brain case, is thin like that of Acanthodes and not like that of Chondrichthyans. So this seems to be some stuff that might help us group together the, these sort of Acanthodians. It looks similar to another animal in this rump clade. And the second, another animal we scanned was Tomacanthus, which if you remember was that second Acanthodian I talked about earlier, which had the part of the brain case preserved. And so this is a far earlier, well, slightly earlier Acanthodian. It's from the lower Devonian rather than the middle Devonian. Uh, it's from the Welsh borders. And this is that, um, that thing with the brain casing we saw earlier. So you're looking down on top of, like, into the pharynx of the animal. So you can see its teeth at the front, that sort of row, it's slightly displaced on the arrow. Uh, the brain case is kind of this splat that you can't see very well in this picture. And the pharynx should lie within a rock. So we scanned it to see if we could find the gill skeleton in this animal. And lo and behold, we did. Um, so this time you're looking uh, at the gill skeleton from the bottom, so like up against the mould of the surface of the specimen, if that makes sense. And these are the arches, these purple things that support the gills. And that yellow thing at the front is the, uh, the bottom jaw, the mechelian cartilage. Um, and what this shows, if you put the brain casey splat over the top of it, is that Acanthodes also has this gill skeleton that's entirely situated underneath the brain case, like in Osteichthians, but the bony fishes, and unlike in the Elasmobranch chondrichthians. Um, and this is, the, this is its shoulder girdle at the back, just to show that like Osteichthians, um, oops, like Osteichthians, it's, um, it's kind of packed in underneath the brain case with the shoulder girdle right behind. Um, so we've also been working on this phylogenetic analysis, incorporating this information, and also trying to kind of tease out a few more acanthogeny characters. I'm not going to go into many specifics, as I suspect they'd only be interested, interesting to acanthogenologists, but we do recover this rump grade that Coates gets, and it still has uh, Diplocanthus in and uh, Acanthodes somewhere over here. Um, so that seems to be supported by our additional information. Uh, some of that, those things that Acanthodes and Diplocanthus have in common help. Gladbacchus, which is that sharky thing that Mike Coates, uh, well, I said that Mike Coates published last year or this year, uh, gets pushed up out of the Acanthodians and up um, sort of more crownwards on the stem. And that's partly due to us finding this compact uh, gill skeleton in um, Tomacanthus. And onto this, uh, this phylogeny, we can map some of these things. Um, and it seems to be that if you look at the animals involved, that um, this broad, flat basi occiput, which is one of these things that chondrichthians have, separates out the more crownwards members of the stem group and, the, and groups them with the crown group to the exclusion of this kind of rump grade. And if we look at the, the kind of evolution of a sharky gill skeleton, um, so there's Tomacanthus with its compact osteichthian-like one, there's Gladbacchus with its uh, extended one. So we can now constrain the evolution of this kind of elasmobranch-like trait um, onto somewhere on the tree between these two things. Um, so to summarise, we found further information in these two Acanthodians, Tomacanthus and Diplocanthus. Diplocanthus looks quite Acanthodes-like in lots of respects, but with a compact uh, gill skeleton. Tomacanthus has this compact osteichthian-like gill skeleton, um, but, and all this information seems to support this uh, Acanthodii rump clade, and we can start to constrain some of these major endoskeletal changes that separate uh, chondrichthians from osteichthians on the chondrichthian stem group. So, there you go.